Guys, welcome to the podcast. This is going to be a fun episode with Greg Krogh of Mogion Rim Outfitters. He is going to be talking about elk hunting in Arizona, mostly in Unit 6A and Unit 9. I want to thank you guys for your support of this podcast and remind you guys that you can always send me a direct message on Instagram at jscottoutdoors or my email jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you guys for your loyal support of this podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors, GoHunt.com. Cody Nelson is the new optics manager at GoHunt.com in the gear shop. You can call Cody directly for info and sales at 702-847-8747, extension 2, or email him at optics at GoHunt.com. I also want to thank Kuyu.com. Uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. You can go to their website, kuyu.com, to order the best hunting gear on the market today. Also, canyoncoolers.com. If you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% off all orders at canyoncoolers.com. Let's get right to this episode. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Greg Krog of Mogi on Rim Outfitters on the line. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing good, Jay. How you doing? Good. You're just about to kick off the Arizona elk season, um, but you just got off the Nevada archery deer season over there. I know we had talked before. I believe you were headed over to Nevada. Um, How did the archery deer season pan out for you and and your guys over in Nevada? You know, it it was a pretty rough season this year. We just didn't seem to catch a lot of breaks. We had some missed shots and um, we did, you know, Jeff Rowe started off really good and shot a really nice buck with a, uh, with a guy out of Canada and, and, uh, it was really rolling. And then we just kind of hit a wall. Me and Campbell were hunting one specific buck for about 10 days and just really got our butts kicked basically. That's archery gear, and, uh, though, isn't it? You know, it is just, Jason is just so good. And it just feel like if you can get an opportunity, it's going to happen. And we never even did a stock, not one stock in 10 days. It was unbelievable. <laughs> We were we were watching two really good bucks regularly right before the season, and then when the season rolled around, we just could not turn them again. And man, we tried; it just never worked out. When when you go through something like that as a hunter and as a guide, I mean, what what's usually your strategy? You just keep pounding the same holes, or you bouncing around, or I mean, I know if well, you're like we, me, we, your your mind's playing tricks with you, saying you know, the over the next ridge, I need to be over there. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I def- it's definitely hard not to think the grass is greener somewhere else, you know, and you always want to go to switch. But I've had the best luck in the past just staying on where I've been seeing him. He's going to eventually go back into that pattern, and it just didn't work out. And I, my belief is he probably went nocturnal. Um, there was a little bit of activity in there um, leading up to the hunt and none prior to that. And I just think they got – I think he just went – both of them just went nocturnal because we were watching one of them until – Gosh, we'd see him for two and a half hours every morning, you know, and then, wow. I mean, four times in the six days leading up to the hunt, and then the number one buck we saw the morning before the hunt and uh, before opening day, and then, we, like I said, 10 days we didn't turn either one of them in really glassable country, too. That was the frustrating part. Is it was just there was a lot of really glassable country where they'd been hanging out in, and, but there was some thick country nearby, and the one time, the last time we saw both of them, they were walking into the thick, and I think they just kind of never came out of it other than at night. What what did the conditions do as far as I know in Arizona they got a bunch of rain. Um, did it did the monsoon, you know, moisture get you over there in Nevada and did you think that changed their pattern a little bit as well? Um, not really. You know, there was um there was a water source nearby that a rancher had had turned off. And it was kind of way in the thick, and uh, which was a water source that he had used last year. So when that got turned on, I think that was the biggest thing. I think they no longer had to come out. We were catching them on the days they were watering in the more open country. And once, once that water got turned on, I think he just disappeared into the thick. And that was probably the biggest thing. We did get rain over there, but nothing like what we got in Arizona this year for a monsoon. At least where I live, it was pretty brutal in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Uh, so the good news is, though, with the rifle hunts coming up, I believe you do a bunch of hunts in October and November. Um, there's there's some bucks that are out there still roaming around. 
Yeah, like I said, you know, those bucks are still around in that unit, and then we had guys in different units, and I was in other units, and, you know, we had some missed shots, and which is, you know, it stinks for the archery hunters, but it does leave those deer that are available now. So we've got a lot of good bucks to go after for the rifle hunt. So I am excited about that. We've had probably as good a year as ever going into the rifle hunt in some of the units. So hopefully it'll, our luck will turn around for the rifle hunts. Yeah, that, that'll be good. Um, moving into Arizona elk season here, uh, you know, less than 10 days away, uh, where are you going to be spending most of your time, what units, uh, you and your guides, and what is the forecast and the outlook? Uh, what What is it looking like out there for you guys? Well, you know, with this month, I'm going to be, I'll have one camp in 6A um, that I'll be in, and then we'll have a guy in 8, and then we'll also be in 9 um, with somebody. So, you know, the rains have been, the monsoons have been so good now that it's, you know, obviously came late for antler growth, but man, the feed's phenomenal out there right now, and there's water everywhere. So, you know, in that regard, it's spreading them out. Um, and I think that'll be probably a good thing for the elk. You know, they're not going to be all so concentrated like they were. But the feed is as good as I've ever seen it out there right now, and, and everything looks great. It's just, and I don't think the antler grows as bad as everybody thinks it is. Um, you know, from what we're seeing, um, we're still seeing good bull. You know, 6A is not a big trophy unit, so obviously we're not seeing real freak bulls, but we're seeing the same type of bulls we see on, on every other year, you know. Not not yeah. nearly as bad of droughted out back ends as I thought it would be. Um, and I know that uh, even in some of the other units, I, I think like units like 9 and, I mean, they're probably 20 points down, it sounds like, you know, from from what we've seen and what everybody else has seen, but that still means there's, you know, there's still some big bulls out there. When you talk about widespread moisture, monsoonal moisture, um, how do you as an outfitter, as a guide, uh, you know, as a hunter, how do you, uh, how does your strategy change, so to speak, if it was dry and maybe the elk were more congregated? Talk a little bit about, you know, the elk spreading out and what that means to the listeners that have elk tags in their pocket. Well, they're just going to be, whenever we have it like this, and there's this much feed and this much water, they're really spread out. They don't even have, there's a lot of feed in the trees, um, like this year, so they don't necessarily have to be out in the big meadows that can stay in the thicker stuff and still get tons of feed because of all the rain. So what it's going to do to us is, you know, obviously you're not going to be as dependent. On, there's a lot more water. There's water standing in all the canyons right now, and, and you don't necessarily have to hit water holes, although I certainly wouldn't back away from them because, you know, as you know, it's a water hole is kind of like a social gathering. Even if there's water in other places, they still go to those water holes. And so, but I think to find the elk this year, we're going to have to do a lot more, you know, maybe at night going out and calling and trying to get them located and, you know, just because I think they are going to be a lot more spread out. So I think that whenever that happens and they're in that thicker stuff and you can't glass them to get on them and go after them, we just do a lot more going out, you know, late at night and calling and getting them located and then coming back in the morning to those spots. Yeah, I mean, to me, when it's um, you know moisture widespread throughout the unit, it's kind of a double-edged sword because sometimes they're a little bit harder to find. But you could also say that if they're spread out, you know, you potentially have people spread out hunting all over instead of in the same pockets. Uh, that's number one. Number two, don't you think you know it, when they get real congregated, it seems like they really get to rutting and breaking antlers when they're spread out a little bit more. Uh, it seems like as a hunter, you can you can kind of move around and kind of have more isolated groups to just kind of hunt and enjoy. Would you agree with that? Hundred percent. Yeah, because you know, like I remember was it two years ago, we went into the season. It was pretty dry monsoon. It was you know, there was a particular part of six A where there were just groups with I mean, literally over a hundred elk. You know, 100, 150 elk in one group with fifteen, twenty bulls running around, and and that does get them redded up and and. I think when they spread out like this, like from what we've been seeing, they're just pretty much everywhere, you know. <laughs> they're really spread out. So it would seem like it would be a lot less. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it would seem like it would be a lot less competition, which then would mean less breakage. Yeah. In units, Greg, like 6A, um, you know, obviously there's a huge difference between unit 9 and 6A from a, just a people running around standpoint. Um, you know, how do you handle... You know, I think there's six or seven hundred ta tags or whatever there is uh, in six A. It's a big unit, but how do you handle more of that pressure? Are there any certain little um, tricks that you use or things that you do that are different, say, than you would in nine or other units? 
You know, even it, it sounds crazy because there's. I don't think it's much different. In fact, the times I sometimes think nine seems like it's more crazy when I'm over there because you know how it is on those real trophy tags. You got much bigger camps, more people helping. Um, it just seems like there's people everywhere when I go to nine. And in six A, it's a little bit different. You know, yeah, there are a lot of tags, but it doesn't seem to be as hardcore. You know, it, you don't have the hard hardcore hunters. It seems like in that unit, if that makes sense. It's a lot of guys that are up there with the. I mean, they have they're all kind of, but they're not taking it super seriously. They're not getting away from the roads. So we just try to get away from the roads. And usually, when we do that, we get away from the people. When you talk about widespread moisture um, and great feed, do you anticipate, you know, a really good rut? Um, are you hearing from your guides? Are the bulls already bugling? What, what's going on as far as the bugling report? Um, they're definitely already starting, you know, and uh, not so much. I'm, we're talking about Arizona. Nevada was a little bit late this year, but they're getting going now. And as far as Arizona goes, they're deaf. I think when they're healthy like that and feeling good, it just it always seems like it's a better year. You know, you've been on those dry drought years where it seems like the rut's not even there. You know, when we don't get that monsoon, and so I think it'll be a really good rut, and um, it seems to be starting right about on schedule. That's good stuff. Um, and I think have, it'll help. I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say. Do you have any tips um, for guys out there with tags in their pocket? Uh, you know, looking at either the archery elk season or you know early rifle or muzzleloader season. You know, staring us right in the face out there. Well, you know, if you're not seeing elk in your normal places, you know, uh, like I said, in years past, especially in six eight, you can go to certain spots where it's real glass blowing. You can always get into them. And on years like this, where there's tons of feed, they kind of get more in the junipers and in there. And when that happens. If you're not finding them glass, and just get out there and, I mean, lots of things. You can either uh, go around at night and call and get them located that way, but but don't rely solely on glassing because when they're in the thicker stuff, the glassing is a lot harder. You you do a lot of um, a lot of your focus of your hunts, whether it's the mule deer or the elk, you, you're a big glasser. Um, what do you look for, you know, not just 6A but in units, in Arizona specifically as a glass or if you're if you're focusing on you know want to glass these elk up what are some things that you look for they just I, I try to find glassing knobs that I can look at the most possible country and then use those big binoculars that we always talk about you know and the more ground you're going to cover the more elk you're going to find I, I try to look at stuff that's I try to focus on stuff that has really big looks and also places that I can keep eyes on the elk you know, once I find them, you know, not so thick that you see them for two seconds and they're in a canyon, you lose sight of them, you know. So I try to pick yeah. places that I can have a huge look that you can see, you know, as much country as you possibly can from that it's a little bit more open when I'm looking for that. So that way when we do find them, we can keep eyes on them. Once you do find them, say you find, a, you know, a group and you've watched them go into the trees, do you a lot of times stay back on that knob that might be, you know, three miles away, or do you try and then pick other knobs that you know they're probably going to feed out in the trees and you're going to cut the distance in half, or what's usually your strategy from that standpoint? Yeah, I use the farther looks when we're trying to get them located, and once you, and you know, once you get on a certain bull, usually he might, it might get on the really big look so we can look at all the elk in the area. And then once you decide what bull we're going after, and if he's typically in one corner, for example, of the area, then we'll go pick a knob closer so that we're a lot closer in better position when we want to go after him. When, uh, compared to mule deer hunting, when you're glassing for elk, say, off these big knobs, um, is your timing different as far as actual eyes in the binoculars and, you know, the, 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 the quickness of panning and what have you? Talk a little bit about how it might change from elk to mule deer or, or mule deer to elk? Yeah, we talk about it all the time. The, elk, the, the, deer, the mule deer, it's so much more meticulous on the glassing. You've got to go so much slower. You probably can't cover, I mean, probably four times less country in, in an hour looking for mule deer than an elk. And these elk, especially when it's just green like this, and they <laughs> look like big yellow school buses out there. You can, you can get away with panning and glassing a lot faster on the elk. And when you're up on these knobs, um, these big looks, um, you know, how much time do you spend, you know, stay sitting and then you, have, you know, pick up and move to the other side? Of, you know, I assume you're up on like a cone knob. How much are you rotating around, say, within an hour? Are you just basically moving 
you know, within an hour, have you covered basically 360? Yeah, I would say, yeah, with elk for sure. I just keep moving as it, like, like in an afternoon. I'll start off and look at it one side, and it doesn't take that long to, you know, on the elk to kind of scan it over, and then I just pop over to the other side instead of just staring at you know, wait for me to get up and start moving out of the trees. So I'll move a lot more on elk around in glass a lot quicker and move around the knob versus deer. You know, deer, I'll, I just, it just takes a lot longer. One more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, from, from a glassing elk perspective, when you're up on a knob and you're looking for elk, and let's say, you, let's say it's the morning and, you know, first light, you're up there and you find a group of elk, and usually they're more in the open and they're moving towards the stick. At that point in time, are you immediately with your hunter trying to get in position there, or do you typically say, okay, we, we know where our bull is, we have a good idea where he's going to come out, and then strategize for an afternoon play, or do you get aggressive and dive right in the tree, um, you know, that morning? You know, that's a great question, because, in like, for example, in places we hunt in 6A, there are certain parts of the unit my guys will give me a hard time, my younger guys, they want to go after everything. And there's certain parts of the unit where, like, you know, if we can pick up a bull and he's going into this group of trees, it just seems like every time the elk are in that particular spot, they always get up early, whether it's maybe hotter or lower, or that kind of slope, and they'll always hit water. So, you know, like there's one particular spot where we hunt where I swear if the bulls are anywhere within a mile of that tank, they're going to hit it before dark. And they always hit it with a, a good wind direction for us. So on those, we'll leave them alone. Then we have other parts from the same knob where you'll see them say, um, off that knob to the east, and I don't think we've ever killed a bull over there in the afternoons. They, they just seem to stay in the canyon. So on those type of spots, we try to really go after them, you know, and be really aggressive because we don't feel like we're messing anything up for the evening. Whereas the ones that are out there on that one end, we just leave them alone and go and sit the water that evening. If there's a if a bull, one of the bulls we're trying to kill is out there, we almost never stalk them in that particular spot. But Looking off the knob the other direction, we never wait for the evening because there's so many different waters on that side, and the wind just doesn't seem to ever be right on any of them. So on those, we'll kind of be more aggressive and take off after them right away. I like to – it doesn't bother me being a little late in the mornings. It just, you know, even when we get on them right away, we never start calling until they're really close to their, you know, beds. I don't start calling until we're right on top, you know, until everything's slowed down. And it just seems like – when you get on them in the dark or, you know, pre, you know, right when it's dawn and you start calling, it just seems like they move away and you can call for yeah. hours and before you know it, you've gone six, seven miles and you'll just keep pushing them away. So what we try to do, if it allows and they're calling, or we can keep, you know, tabs on them, I won't call at all and just keep staying with them, staying with them until they're, until they're in that area where, they, you know, the cows will start to bed. And then the bull has no choice but to come in because he's not going to be able to get his cows up. And that's when we've had our best luck. That's a really good tip. I think that, that's super important, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, at first life, they're usually moving from those congregation areas kind of to the bedding area, and while that gives good places to, you know, maybe ambush them out in that broken country, from a calling standpoint, they're usually headed away from you. Um, from what I hear you saying, you like them to slow down in the trees, and then you can actually you know, get in there tight and work those actual bulls. Yeah, I would I would say 20 to 1, I have better luck calling them in their beds or right, you know, right in that area, in their bedding area versus it just seems like it. I mean, every once in a while I get that bull that's so hot, he turns around and comes in, but for every time that happens, there's another 20 times where you just run them into the next county, follow them and call them, you know. So I, <laughs> I like to wait until they get in their bedding areas, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people think you should stay out of their bedding areas, but uh, that's where we've had our best luck is when they get into that because once those cows start laying down and moving where he can't, then then he just has no choice but to come back and protect them. Yeah, to, you sure. know, I just think they come in so much more aggressive that way. Are you? Um, I know we've talked about long range glassing a lot, and you've used the Doctor Forties, and you've used the Coas, and you've used the Swarovski BTX. Um, is there one that you're leaning? Uh, towards this season that you you know you like better or that you're using right now and why you know the the two big ones that i use are the uh i use the btx's the btx 95s and i also still use my doctor 40s the, the the fixed 40 wide angles and it just depends on the look it's 
if I'm, uh, I have neck issues, you know, I, I think we've talked about before, and I really like the angled eyepiece for that, so much better on my nerves and my neck. Um, and, and the BTXs are lighter. Um, I still like the doctors for longer looks because they're a little bit more powerful. You know, they're a 40 power and, um, and a bigger field of view. So, but I, you know, I probably, I would say I, 80% of the time I use the, the BTXs. And then about 20% of the time, I, I use those Dr. 40s. And also by rotating them, it, it help, actually helps my neck, you know, going back and forth. So you're not constantly in the same position, you know, for weeks and weeks at a time. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, Greg, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. I uh, look forward to seeing you guys' the success here coming up on the Arizona elk season. And um, those bucks, uh, those bucks are in trouble over there in Nevada on the October and November hunts. I know it. And you guys always mop them up pretty darn good in those rifle hunts. So um, good luck with that and um, knock them down on the Arizona elk season for sure. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. God bless. Take care.